please visit sleepapia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us, and enjoy! Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today at sleepapnea.org for our weekly speaker series. We are excited to have uh, Dr. David Dowsey join us today. He is an epidemiologist and also the vice president of Duquesne University. And we have Kevin Bradley here joining us as our uh, community educator for the ASAA. We're excited to have Dr. Dowsey here today uh, to talk about updates on COVID, what's going on with the vaccine, sleep and your immune system. He has a lot of great information to share with our community and to the general population. So we're excited to have him here today. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad to be here. So um, let's just give a little quick uh, COVID update. What is going on right now, uh, Dr. Dowsey, with COVID in the U.S. and, and, and uh, with, with vaccine? What's, what's the current status of everything? Well, what we're seeing right now unfold in the U.S. is what you see happen in pandemics. Things happen in waves. You know, uh, some areas peak in infections while other areas see decline. What we're seeing around the country uh, is simultaneous peaks because the disease is spreading more as people go indoors and as people take fewer precautions and have house parties and other things. So in the US, you're seeing the reenactment of lockdowns or restrictions from government officials. And so it, it really is important that everyone uh, remain uh, you know, as careful as possible at this point in time to try to stymie the spread of disease as much as possible. Yeah, I, w the three of us here today on uh, on this on this um, video are all located all over the U.S. and even Canada. I'm I'm located in the southeast. You're in the northeast, uh, Dr. Dowsey, and and Kevin, uh, as many people know, is is in Canada. And um, you know, right now here where I am in Florida, you know, cases are rising, but things really haven't changed too much in regards to you know, restaurants closing down or anything happening, uh, you know, with the maybe say daily aspects of your life. We're still kind of in that mediocre area where they're limiting things, but not closing down. But the cases are still rising right now. Most of the hospitals in the area seem to be able to handle things that are going on. What's happening in Canada where you are, in, uh, Kevin? Yeah, thank you, Justine, um, and thank you, David, for joining us. What a privilege we are to to have you here. Um, you know, in Canada at the moment, in Ontario, we're looking at like regional lockdowns. So the whole area hasn't completely locked down, but some downtown areas in Toronto and some other regions have shut. Um, it's essential services only that have been open. Now, that's been going on now for about the past two weeks. But in Ontario, I know, you know, the numbers may not be too alarming as far as um, when I say this, but it's like we're averaging around 1,900 new COVID cases per day. Um, so when you consider the population as well here, you know, we're, we're quite concerned about that because since the lockdown, we haven't really seen a big difference or change. It dipped a little bit to 1,600 for about a day or two and then just came back to 1900. So I anticipate further um, municipalities and areas around um, Ontario are going to close um, now in the next week or two. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Dalsy, uh, in the uh, Pennsylvania area? What's going on there? So just a few days ago, the governor enacted um, restrictions again that are not as severe as the first lockdown but are targeting businesses like restaurants, um, uh, any type of public gatherings above 10 people, um, any type of venue that um, uh, a bar or any type of venue that serves food. So there are restrictions now in place and those things are absolutely um, likely to, um, to, to potentially increase. The, the governor right now has set those things through January 4th, but um, they may go longer depending on what's happening with the data uh, that we see in the Commonwealth. Yeah. 
So with all of these differences that are, you know, happening here in the U.S., you know, uh, across the entire entire world, you know, the big hot topic is uh, the vaccines are being delivered. You know, we see we have seen the videos with the trucks, refrigerated trucks coming in and everybody clapping and cheering. And um, so can you can let's let's move into a little bit of talk about how that is going to uh, you know, affect the course of, of, of our lives and what's happening and, you know, give us a little bit of history, you know, and, and education on just, you know, vaccines in general. So, Kevin, I'll let you go ahead and, and kick off some questions there. Yeah, you know, I think the main concern with a lot of people, obviously, is they feel that this vaccination or vaccine, sorry, has been rolled out a little bit too fast. So people are concerned about getting the vaccine. Um you know, here in, um, I'm sure in the States and in Canada, there's a hierarchy of um, people that are going to be getting it first. And here they're going to roll it out to the uh, long-term care facilities, health care workers, then the over 70s. So it's, it sort of comes down to then eventually get into the general population. But can you just give us some information how we can um, reassure people that this vaccine is, is quite safe? Sure, thank you, Kevin. And what I will tell everyone is that there are two different types of vaccines uh, right now, uh, two broad categories of vaccines. One are the conventional vaccines, which are developed in more conventional ways. Uh, literally, these things are developed through um, mammalian cells or uh, chicken eggs um, versus the messenger ribonucleic acid, the messenger RNA vaccines, uh, which are newer and have not been, uh, we've not had a messenger RNA vaccine that has been used broadly um, and distributed uh, around the world uh, like this. As a matter of fact, this is the first time. Uh, what I can say about the development of these is first, they were developed very quickly, but some of the things that require um, us to take a lot of time with vaccines are because we're dealing with the conventional challenges. And that's why the messenger RNA vaccines, uh, two of them, one from Pfizer and one from Moderna, um, have you know made it first out of the gate here. Um, the uh, vaccine from AstraZeneca that was developed um, at the University of Oxford is a conventional vaccine. So the two R uh, RNA vaccines that we're dealing with, these messenger RNA vaccines, what I should say is that after SARS and MERS, which were both human coronaviruses, we made tremendous progress. And this is literally over the past decade on um, using messenger RNA for vaccines. In addition to that, we've been using messenger RNA to try to understand cancer and cancer treatments for a long period of time. So it's not as new as people think. And uh, I'm quite confident that the technology is in place and that the vaccines are in fact safe. Right. That's interesting. I didn't know the, the 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 complex history of the RNA development. It's just it's kind of a new term. You know, obviously, if if you have been a patient in the cancer world or, you know, has had someone close to you with that and participating in, in, in a lot of information in that community it might not, uh, you know, might be something that, you know, and that's why videos like today are great, because we get to, you know, learn from each other on these types of things. And, you know, so it's not as new or scary. Or, or something to be as worried about uh, just because you've never heard it before. It's actually been around for, for, for quite a while. Um, talk to us a little bit just about how, you know, vaccines in general work and, and how they help a community population and area, you know, overcome something, uh, overcome a virus, overcome a disease. You know, just, I mean, there's been, I mean, vaccines have been around for, for I mean, at least my entire life. Uh, you know, our, most of our, you know, our parents probably got them at school. You know, there used to be a time, you know, when you got your vaccines at school. Uh, and and so, how, you know, talk to us a little bit about how all that is has taken place. Sure. The conventional vaccines either use um, inactivated uh, pathogens or particles of pathogens to stimulate an immune response. And what it does is it basically tricks your body into, um, you know, developing the T cells and things necessary to respond to the disease when you actually come into contact with it um, in its full virility. Um, and so that is the way that a conventional vaccine is used. And almost every conventional vaccine we have to date does exactly that. Uh, the messenger RNA vaccines are different. They actually uh, put a sequence of RNA into your, uh, into your body that basically um, 
changes the way that your body reacts and produces a certain protein. So it's a disease specific antigen that is attached to RNA that helps your body to develop an immune response. So it's a, it's a completely different pathway to develop immunity. It's something that quite frankly, until we did this uh, particular vaccine with both Pfizer and Moderna, in theory was to work, but it wasn't until we demonstrated this through clinical trials that we could prove that this in fact is an effective strategy towards immunizing people for a virus like this. So even though there's those two different paths that uh, that a, 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 um, a, vac a vaccine can take, that it's still the same result in the end. The, the human being has the immunity to when they encounter the virus through their everyday life or what have you, it is it, it is not making you as sick or you're you know not going to have um, it's not going to make you sick at all or not make you as sick as if you didn't have those that immunity to it. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say. So it's it's like giving your body a jump start in order to prepare. So one of the challenges is you know if your body uh, comes into contact with a new pathogen. Uh, sometimes it's too slow to respond, or sometimes, uh, like we've seen with COVID, you get these cytokine storms where the body sort of over responds. Um, and so it's those two extremes we're trying to deal with. So. And, yeah. And I think what you're talking about there is is what some of the the professionals and and medical providers have been saying that there's just once someone um, contracts COVID, you know, depending on some other factors there, there's like a cascade of symptoms and stuff that happened, at, you know, after that, because of their, you know, diabetes or high blood pressure or something like that. Or maybe even something in their gen genetic makeup. The interesting thing about COVID-19 is we're still learning about what it is that makes certain people more susceptible to severe disease than others. And so we have a number of hypo hypotheses and a number of things that we've studied, but the reality is we still don't fully appreciate and understand the factors that make it so that one person gets severely ill and dies and another person is asymptomatic and doesn't even know they're sick. Yeah. yeah. And you know, Dr. Dowsey, it seemed to strike me as well, you know, even when this all started out that, you know, this virus does seem to be, you know, it's indiscriminate. And certainly we've seen stories of people in their 20s that have succumbed to the virus. And then also people that are maybe a little bit older that, um, you know, have, have died by the virus as well. But given my background in transplantation and people that are immunosuppressed, is this vaccine safe for people that are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed? So the, the short answer is that, you know, we've done uh, clinical trials now. Um, some individuals uh, have been included that um, are immunosuppressed. Uh, as we look at this and look at the data, there's nothing that in the, the data right now presents that to suggest that it would be uh, negative for those individuals. And what I would argue is those individuals are at greater risk uh, for having severe disease with COVID-19 because, you know, if you've got uh, an immunosuppressed uh, or immunocompromised um, a sister situation happening, uh, getting a vaccine is actually uh, a high priority for you because if you get COVID, you may be more likely to um, have severe illness as a result. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And in talking about, you know, dealing with, you know, certain communities and, and the vaccine, um, one of the things that this pandemic has brought to light is um, the skepticism of, of certain cultural communities to healthcare, to particular information relating to healthcare vaccines and so forth. How, how is that affecting, you know, the, the, the public health aspect of, of this situation right now? It's an issue of very serious concern, to be honest. So one of the big challenges we're facing right now is the tremendous amount of misinformation that the public is getting both through social media and in some examples through elected leaders. So w w Public Health 101, one of the things you learn is that you have to be consistent in your message and clear in your message. Uh, the message is consistent and clear here. If you're in the public health world, it's consistent and clear. Um, so what I can tell you is that the, you know, uh, the individuals that are spreading misinformation, including those that are just bent set against vaccines in general to begin with, forget the COVID vaccine, is a major problem. And then we have had uh, challenges over time with populations of color. So uh, there was uh, the Tuskegee uh, 
uh, work, which um, you know was uh, a blight on this country's history, and uh, you know for for uh, uh, populations of color. And so there are many other reasons why these populations may uh, be more likely to be concerned about the vaccine. Uh, and it's a shame because we need to reach all people. And uh, you know, we're, in some regards, uh, the U.S. has shot itself in the foot here in our communications with with this particular disease. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's that, that's why we're happy to have you on today to, you know, to talk to our community about, you know, the importance of um, talking with your doctor, getting the vaccine when available. You know, if you are in a high risk group, um, you know, talk to them about about that uh, situation. And also, I think it's important to note that, you know, we see all this stuff on TV right now about, oh, yay, the vaccines are coming and they're here in the trucks. But it's going to be a little while before, let's say, the three of us here on, you know, on on camera are actually going to get the vaccine. So that doesn't mean you could just toss your masks away and forget the hand sanitizer and and you know what have you and let down all of your your guards and the protocols you've been following. You know, just as you we were talking about all the different communities and places that we're living with all of the different, you know, types of um, restrictions that are going on. I think it's really important to remind everybody. You know, we're not, we're, we see the light, but we're not quite there yet. We're not out of the tunnel yet. Fair no, to say. <laughs> that's, that's very fair to say. And what I will tell you is that, you know, the vaccine, uh, the two, uh, the, uh, both uh, Pfizer and Moderna, and I believe now even the AstraZeneca vaccine require two doses. And so you'll get it. And then um, I think it's three weeks for Pfizer and four weeks for Astra or four weeks for Moderna that you have to wait and then get another uh, booster shot. Um, and then it's only two weeks after that that your body achieves, you know, really the full immune response. So you're talking about a period of from between first vaccination and um, full immunity that could be a few months. And so over that period, those individuals that get vaccinated will need to wear face masks and engage in social distancing, even though they've received the vaccine. So all these people you're seeing get um, shots on television and other things, those folks, it'll be another two months before they're really ready for prime time. Um, and uh, even then, because of the fact that we're still not sure if, uh, if they, you know, um, how, how capable they will be able to spread the disease asymptomatically, we're still going to ask folks to wear the face masks and stay socially distanced. So social distance and face masks will be well, with us well into the fall. Yeah. Gina, sorry, can I just ask? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so Dr. Dawson, that raises an interesting point, you know, when I've been reading up some things and there doesn't seem to be a lot of information out there about um, people that had reinfections. Um, I did look at a couple of studies with somebody in Nevada and a 42-year-old from Virginia that experienced second um, waves or second infections. And, I mean, the test showed the two slightly different strains of the virus. Um, so the question is, that is, was the second bout more severe for them? Um, what do we know about the antibodies and, and why do we need to... Uh, vaccinations and do we check antibodies in between or not? Great questions. What I can tell you is for the reinfection, there's still a lot of questions in the scientific community because if you naturally acquire the disease, the question really is how much immunity do you have and how long do you have immunity? Uh, and that's, we really don't know the, the answer to that. And so there are some people question the folks that appear to have been reinfected, uh, whether or not uh, they just had a test uh, the first time, which is inaccurate because, you know, the sensitivity and specificity of the tests is not 100%. Um, and for those individuals where we feel greater confidence that they had um, a, a reinfection, you know, what exactly about their immune system and their immune response resulted in that, uh, in that reinfection? So there, there are lots of questions uh, related to the vaccine and why you need two shots. There are a lot of times when we get vaccinations where we need uh, multiple shots. Um, and in this uh, example, uh, we want to make sure that we achieve the level of efficacy that's going to prevent people from getting severe disease, the, the sort of the, the disease that will put you into the hospital or potentially kill you. Um, and the research demonstrated that, um, you know, two, uh, vac two shots was required to get your body to that point um, where you had the titers in your blood to, uh, to, to effectively respond. I do not believe there are plans in place right now to check the titers in people's blood the way that we do if you get a, 
um, a hepatitis B vaccine, for example. Um, but you know, it is a concern, um, and we'll be closely monitoring. Um, you know, uh, looking for folks that um, you know might get infected. I believe, based on the technology and based on the research that I've seen, that we will have longer-term immunity. Uh, from these vaccines, the uh, messenger RNA vaccines, I think greater than a year, how much greater, I don't know, but I think that it's definitely going to be greater than a year. Sure. And you know, the reason I do ask that is that it's funny you did mention that because years ago when I did get a hep B vaccination, um, my surface B antibodies were low and I required a booster. So it's just, uh, I was curious to see if that was something that was going to be in play. And it also leads us to talk about the logistics of rolling out this vaccine and the distribution around that. Have um, you any um, insight about how that's going to happen? So it's interesting. The, the United States, is, as part of all of our planning, uh, we, we started uh, the discussion of uh, the distribution of vaccine a while ago. The overall communication strategy for that uh, has not been executed. And so I work with local and state uh, public health officials, where they they don't 100% uh, know, uh, you know what what exactly the the the, uh, the the plans are for distributing this vaccine. So, for example, I work at a university. Are we going to be given the vaccine and our health students administering that vaccine to our population? Um, are we doing it in some other way? I do know that um, our pharmacy school, for example, uh, has been trained and the pharmacy students will be helping to administer vaccine in our community. How that will be distributed in the community is, it, are they going to open up um, the hockey arena and tell everyone to go inside there and, and, and do it in one uh, mass uh, situation like that? Are they going to uh, ship it to every place that has a refrigerator that can store it and send, you know, allow those companies to do it themselves? So, for example, a lot of universities have refrigeration systems that can, uh, you know, keep the vaccine as cold as it needs to be held. So do you allow those you know, in Pittsburgh, we have the University of Pittsburgh, which has tens of thousands of students and employees. Do they just allow them to administer their own vaccines? Those are all questions that that have to be resolved. And I know policymakers are presently working on them, but uh, t time is short. And so we, we need to come to resolution. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's some great information. Just, you know, overview of, of, of uh, vaccines, how they work, uh, what's going on specifically with, with, with the various types of COVID vaccines that are out there. Um, and, you know, as we all know, we're talking here to the sleep community here on this video today and getting out. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, vaccines, you know, your immune system and how sleep kind of plays, plays a role in that. We have definitely talked to experts in the past, you know, where, and, and as we all know from our childhood with, you know, your mother or your parent, you get a cold, which is a virus, where they tell you, you need to rest and you need to get your sleep and that's how you're going to get better. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Let's, let's hear from you, Dr. Dalzi, on the sleep's role in um, building up your immunity. Sure. Sleep is actually one of the most crucial things for your health period. Uh, and so um, as, as we think about sleep, uh, the reason I'm so happy to, to have organizations like this one is it is absolutely fundamental to the health and well-being of human beings. Forget diseases and viruses. When you add in the situation of uh, diseases and viruses like COVID, um, it's a risk factor for disease. And so if you're getting fractured sleep or you have sleep apnea or, or you're having trouble um, you know, getting a full night's uh, sleep for the appropriate amount of time, you're actually a greater risk for um, COVID and greater risk for a wide variety of other diseases um, and, and health complications. So it is really, really critical that uh, individuals get the appropriate amount of sleep each night. Um, and that um, if they are, they're trouble doing that, that they, you know, pursue avenues to ensure that they can. Related to um, immunity, you weaken your immunity if you're not sleeping appropriately. And so your immune system is weakened. And that is actually, again, another factor that can increase the probability of disease, a wide variety of diseases, but, you know, especially things like COVID and flu and, and other um, seasonal ailments that you might come across. So there are many different layers here to dig down into, but sleep is, is a critical component to um, fighting this disease and to making sure that your immune system is in the best shape it can be uh, to help you prevent getting the disease prior to getting a vaccine. 
Okay, so I did a little bit of uh, research. I was looking for some information on, you know, sleep and um, the potency or efficacy, if I'm using the right word to describe that, or, or immune buildup of a vaccine. And um, there was a there's a, a doctor at UCSF, which is University of California, San Francisco, and um, it was interesting because in I think it was 2012 he did a study for uh, hepatitis B vaccines. And he looked at um, after you received the vaccine, if you were getting less than six hours of sleep a night, the um, immunity buildup for that vaccine was lower than you know the control group who slept more than six hours. Um, and the same doctor, uh, Dr. Prather, in 2000 and just this year in 2020, uh, did a, another survey that looked at your sleep before you got the vaccine. That if you, you know, have uh, interrupted sleep and you know sleep apnea, insomnia, disrupted sleep, that in the days leading up to when you actually received that vaccine, you know, your body responded to it in a lower capacity than those that were getting full night's sleep. So I think that that, you know, goes along with exactly what you were saying, Dr. Dowsey, that, you know, sleep is important every single day for your body to repair, to, you know, be able to um, face what it needs to on a daily basis, especially when you're dealing with, with a virus or with vaccines. So, you know, um, taking time to, you know, talk to your doctor about any sleep issues that you're having. Um, you know, it's going to be probably a couple of months before the larger population gets um, gets uh, the vaccine. So, you know, if you're having sleep issues, now might be the time to really start to address those so that you're well rested and, you know, your body is ready and it's, you know, going to help you just in general, you know, with, with, with COVID and then also with, with the vaccine. Absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, if you want your body's immune system to be able to respond in the optimal way it needs to respond uh, when you receive a vaccine, the best way you're going to do that, uh, one of the best things you can do is to ensure that you've got um, uh, solid sleep and healthy sleep. Um, and so for individuals where that's not occurring, um, there's no time like the present because the reality is that come April or May, most people are going to be vaccinated. And so there's something you could do right now to make it so that uh, you're not going to be one of the 5% of people that uh, don't that don't take to the vaccine well and where it doesn't confer the same type of immunity to you as it confers to the rest of the population. Yeah. Sure. Can I just ask something just regarding that and, and jumping on the, the immunity? And when we talked earlier about herd immunity, we heard that um, again a lot when this pandemic had started. But what's the general feeling out there in the scientific community to state how much, how many percentage of people should be vaccinated in order for this to be effective in our communities? That's a great question. What I can tell you is, you know, textbook epidemiology will tell you somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the population. Uh, most people ballpark and say about 70 percent of the people need to become immune either through getting the disease themselves and developing natural immunity or vaccine induced immunity. One of those two paths. Um, the idea of achieving herd immunity without a vaccine is it's just doesn't seem feasible with this particular disease without a huge death rate. So right now in the US, we're at an estimated 15 to 20% um, immunity. And again, we don't know how long that natural acquired immunity lasts. Um, and 300,000 people have died. So, you know, multiply that by, you know, uh, a, a factor of five to figure out uh, what you might need if you wanted to achieve herd immunity um, without um, a vaccine. So the vaccine is really critical, but it is highly important that as many people as possible, as many people can take this vaccine. That's going to prevent severe disease from spreading in the population. Most importantly, it's going to allow us to open our economy back up and for life to go back to normal. Without that, um, you know, most people are not willing to play Russian roulette when they go outside uh, and risk the fact that they could end up on a mechanical ventilator for three months or worse, die. Uh, and I want to emphasize, especially to any young people listening, um, the number one issue with um, hospital, uh, hospitals and ICUs around the country and around the world is that they're being overwhelmed by young people 
who need those beds. So uh, the young people know we're not dying, but they are responsible for, in many places, the majority of hospitalizations. Um, and I don't know, uh, for, for those folks that have never been on a mechanical ventilator or had to experience that, sometimes you need PT for weeks or longer afterwards. Um, it takes you out of the game for a long time. So just because uh, you might not die from the disease, it doesn't mean it won't have a significant disruption on your life if you get it and end up with severe disease. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, in, in springboarding onto that too, for those that are a little bit skeptical, skeptical, sorry, about getting the vaccine, what, what, would, you, what would you tell them? Well, you know, it's, it's a matter of people's tolerance for risk. But what I can tell you is in my assessment, the risk of getting the disease and potentially having severe disease is much uh, worse than the risk of complications from the vaccine. Uh, we've put these things through clinical trials, which are the gold standard of research and, and found very few complications and very few problems um, with uh, sometimes samples of tens of thousands of individuals. So the reality is that uh, your greater risk in my assessment is by uh, rolling the dice and potentially getting the disease itself uh, where you could have potential um, near-term consequences and then, you know, potential long-term consequences to uh, getting the disease as well. We just don't know yet. Yeah, I, I think what you what you mentioned before about, you know, the, the, the younger population and, you know, to really stop and think about, I know that um, my mom received a couple of months ago, you know, a text from the county that she was living in that said, you know, they had 70 ICU beds left. That was it. You know, that, you know, you needed to stay home when you can. You needed to, you know, make sure you were taking all of the precautions. That it's not just, you know, yeah, like, you know, you could go into the hospital and, 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 and you know, a couple of days later leave relatively healthy, you know, and, and, and okay. But when there are 500 of you that feel like that and need to go to the hospital at the exact same time, then, you know, you're not all going to have a bed there. And then what's going to happen? You know, something that may have kept you in the hospital for a couple of days that you were able to recover from now is much more serious. And, you know, the complications of it are compounding and you can't get in the hospital. So I think that's, you know, a, a big point to, to raise and make sure that everyone is aware of that. It's not just, you know, um, uh, as simple as, oh, I'll go to the hospital. I'll be better in a couple of days, you know, happened to so-and-so. They were fine. And that's one of the things that's important for people to understand about restrictions. There's been a lot of uh, folks that are, uh, you know, upset and saying it's a violation of their individual freedoms, et cetera. Uh, policymakers have no choice. So the simple fact of the matter is you only have oh, so many hospital beds, so many ICU beds in your region. If, if the hospitals become overwhelmed, they can't um, treat people who have uh, a car or coming in from a car wreck or um, have an acute health condition like a heart attack. And so it's really, really, really important that we not allow our healthcare system to become overwhelmed. And unfortunately, in the U.S., we spent the last decade reducing the total number of hospital beds in the relentless pursuit of uh, efficiency in our healthcare system. That was largely successful, but that means we have fewer than three beds per thousand population. And um, on any given day prior to COVID, two thirds of those beds were in use. So we have effectively in the U.S. less than one hospital bed per thousand individuals. So the reality is that uh, policymakers have no choice. If they enact restrictions, they're trying to enact these restrictions so that if you get into a car wreck, there's a place for you to get treatment. Absolutely. Yeah, I had read I had read something, uh, you know, that you had written online, Dr. Dalzi, about, you know, the number of hospital beds. And I, you know, I had never looked that up or paid any attention to it. And it was it is pretty amazing to think about that. You said that there's what, three per 1000 people. That seems very <laughs> low, in my opinion, <laughs> unprofessional well, it's low, opinion. <laughs> it's low when you compare it to South Korea or Japan that have 12. And so and then when you compare it to the rest of most of Europe, where they all have four, five, six and above. Um, and that's not even getting into healthcare capacity where we have fewer doctors per thousand here in the US than they have in uh, many other developed countries in the world, including Italy and Germany and Switzerland. So uh, I could go on and on. We just don't have the capacity in this country, in the United States to handle this. And uh, Kevin, uh, Canada faces the same situation. They, they also have fewer than three uh, hospital beds per thousand. They also have a lot of efficiencies because the National Health Service model drove that efficiency 
as well. It works fine when you're trying to keep healthcare costs down. It doesn't work fine when you're dealing with a, a global pandemic. Absolutely. And then you throw into the mix as well, where people get sick and people are either off sick, they're quarantining, they're isolating, or they've had an exposure. So your resources are also diminished even, even more. So it's not even a bad. You may have the bad. There may not be anybody to take care of you, you know. I, I joked when we were when I was doing pandemic preparedness around the world and we were writing reports, we were always writing reports about pop-up hospitals and pop-up this and pop-up that. And I said, unfortunately, we don't have pop-up respiratory therapists and pop-up doctors. And yeah. so we, we haven't figured out how to like press a button and make a doctor appear. And so, you know, we might be able to expand bed capacity by using gymnasiums and other things. We can't uh, do that when it comes to uh, a lot of these issues. And when it comes to respiratory issues, one of the things I want to emphasize is if you're a respiratory therapist, you're often trained on certain machines, et cetera. So even if we were able to push machines around the country, uh, mechanical ventilators around the country, you have to be trained on that machine to actually effectively use it. So um, even finding personnel that are trained on the correct machines to, to utilize that is is critical, and that's why respiratory therapists around the country, who are in fact heroes, uh, have just been uh, worked to the bone and are exhausted in this yeah. pandemic. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a that's a, that's a very interesting point, right? You know, your pop up doctor. Yeah, I remember yeah. when they in the beginning when you know New York City built the the field hospital in I think Central Park, and they put the ship there, and everything, you know, and. Uh, and it's probably, you know, part of it too is if, you know, if, the, if you don't do these things and then you need them, then, you know, you, you are frowned upon for not having it. And then if you do do it and not that many people show up, you get frowned upon anyways for us. So you're kind of in stuck between the rock and the hard place for that. So, so think about these statistics. Um, one in about 380 people in New York City has died from COVID-19. So process that one in about 380 people or fewer uh, has died of COVID-19. That's a shocking statistic. We are approaching one in a thousand Americans uh, having died from COVID-19. Think about that. One in every thousand people died of COVID-19. Uh, as we pass through the new year, we are likely to see that number be less, like one in 900. So th those are shocking statistics when you look at them and think, wow, you know, one in a thousand people, that sounds like an awful lot of people. It is a profound number of people, more than the number of people who died from World War II, uh, more than the number of people who died on 9-11 dying every single day due to this disease. So for people that equate this with influenza, there's nothing comparable about what we're experiencing with influenza. Just to give you a sense, influenza reported deaths each year are somewhere between 10 and 20,000 max. And then the CDC uses an algorithm because they assume we've missed a lot of deaths. And then they estimate, it always estimates, you know, somewhere between 30 and 60,000, sometimes a little bit more estimated. Right now, the actual deaths that are being reported for COVID are at over, you know, or 300,000 now or more and are, are likely to increase over time. So it's shocking to look at those numbers and to realize just how much larger this is. And the reality is when the dust settles, um, th these numbers will be much higher because again, these are actual numbers. And the reality is that there are people that are getting this disease and dying from it that are where that's not being attributed to the disease. Uh, but we'll be able to do a retrospective that after this to really find those numbers. Right, right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and sorry, Justine, were you going to say something? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, our, our sleep apnea community is is well aware of comorbid and co-occurring conditions. I mean, you know, we've done a lot of patient surveys and talked a lot about that in the past. Um, you know, our population is dealing with high blood pressure and diabetes, often, uh, you know, obesity and, um, you know, just uh, mood and, and depression issues. And um, so, yeah, so, you know, we're, we're used to dealing with all those things and it complicates it with this current, this current virus and situation, you know, go ahead. Kevin. Oh, go ahead. Kevin. So no, Dr. Dawson, like I don't want to undermine, and I think you, you really give a great example there about how severe this virus actually is and how people should take it very seriously. You know, being in healthcare as well and being an ex-ICU nurse, and I know how ICUs operate and I've, you know, visited ICUs recently. 
Um, and, I, and I think you did display that really well about how we should take it seriously. But if we could leave on a positive note, what, what would you tell people out there? We're, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. The beginning of the end of this pandemic is here. And the solution is at hand. The vaccines are the solution at hand. They are safe. They are going to change the world. Uh, we are going to go back to normal. Uh, we're going to be able to be back in public. We're going to be able, able to sort of be out uh, doors without face masks, go on vacations again, uh, spend time in restaurants, visit with family members, in particular elderly family members. Please get that vaccine. Help us to reopen the global economy. It's going to come back stronger than ever. And uh, there's so many positive things here. But the beginning of the end of this pandemic has happened. We're already there. And now we just need to make it through that tunnel. We can all see the light. We just need to hold each other's hands and go for it. Mm -hmm. Metaphorically, how did you? From six feet apart. <laughs> exactly six feet, two arm elbow lines. Elbow to elbow. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Great, great. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great note to to start to wrap it up on. So you know, just like you said, that we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and we all just need to stick together and keep up with all of the protocols and everything that we've been doing thus far to keep ourselves and our family and our loved ones safe. And, you know, we know the holidays are fast approaching and it is not looking like it has in the past and that's okay. That's okay. It can be like that for one year and we can, you know, like you said, get back to family and fun and restaurants and vacations and all the stuff that we'll even enjoy more because we haven't, you know, uh, had it for, for a little while. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, as they say, right? Well, I, uh, Dr. Dalsey, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and talking to our community about this. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Kevin, for ha helping us out. I think we had a great talk and we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleepapnea.org slash donate for details. SAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.